Hey there, Culture Gab Fest listeners. Before we start the show, I want to let you know about a story coming up a little later. It's from one of our partners, SAP. Is your business reaching an exciting turning point? Are you ready to seize the moment for growth? When you're facing uncertainty, SAP can help you be ready for anything that happens next. To learn more, head to sap.com slash be ready. And stick around to hear how AI can future-proof your business. This show is sponsored by Charles Schwab. Schwab believes every investor deserves to work with a firm they can count on. That's why Schwab has 400 local branches with financial consultants ready to serve you, along with professional answers and 24-7 live help. And it's backed by Schwab's satisfaction guarantee. If you are not completely satisfied, Schwab will reimburse eligible fees related to your concern. Visit schwab.com slash satisfaction to learn what's included and how it works. Charles Schwab, own your tomorrow. I'm Dana Stevens, and this is the Slate Culture Gab Fest, Napoleon Attempts to Conquer edition. It's Wednesday, November 29th, 2023, and on today's show, we'll be talking about the new historical epic Napoleon, directed by Ridley Scott. We'll also discuss the animated Netflix series Scott Pilgrim Takes Off and the Andre 3000 album New Blue Sun. Joining me today is Jamel Bowie, columnist for The New York Times and the host of the podcast Unclear and Present Danger. Hey, Jamel, good to have you on. Thank you for having me. Very, very nice to hear your voice. Also joining us is our beloved longtime co-host, Julia Turner of the Los Angeles Times. Hey, Julia. Hello, hello, Dana. Hoping that you are both rested and restored from your holiday weekend. We're actually going to talk in our plus segment today a little bit about what we cooked on our holiday weekend. But let's dive in to this week's show. Sir Ridley Scott, Knight of the Realm, has had some history-making successes and some equally high-profile failures over the course of his nearly five-decade-now-long career as a filmmaker. In that sense, Scott has something in common with Napoleon Bonaparte, the Corsican upstart who crowned himself the Emperor of France in 1804 and went on to conquer, or try to conquer, much of the European continent. Ridley Scott is 86 years old now, and he's just come out with his 28th movie, Napoleon, starring Joaquin Phoenix as that legendary historical figure. The film covers the last more or less 30 years or so of Napoleon's life, so essentially from the aftermath of the French Revolution period through his death in 1821. Let's listen to a clip from the movie before we get our conversation started. In this clip, you will hear the voice of Joaquin Phoenix as Napoleon uh, in the moment that he he famously uh, seizes the crown, places it on his own head, and declares himself the emperor of France. I found the crown of France in the gutter. I picked it up with the tip of my sword and cleaned it and placed it atop my own head. The most glorious, the most august Napoleon Emperor of the French is crowned and enthroned. Long live the Emperor! Long live the Emperor! I think it's worth noting, along with that audio, that the visuals you get in this scene, this very sumptuous, long view of, of Napoleon crowning himself in front of the, the French court is direct from the Jacques-Louis David painting of this moment. It's a very familiar, you know, if you've been to the Louvre, you've seen a grand version of exactly what Ridley Scott is showing you. Jamel, I'm going to start with you on this one for the reason that I think of you as somebody who knows a lot about this period in history, at least certainly in American history. And obviously, there's a huge overlap between what was going on in Europe and the U.S. at this time. In fact, I think the day that I went to see Napoleon, I had just seen you post something to social media about George Washington refusing to be made king. I don't know if you were in inspired by the release of Napoleon to be talking about that, but you were precisely talking about the meaning of, you know, kingship in the early 19th century. So you seem like a natural to ask about this. We're not necessarily going for historical accuracy in a big Ridley Scott epic about about history, but since you are more a historian than the other two of us, I thought I would start with you. What do you think of Napoleon? When I heard that there was going to be a Napoleon movie, I was like, oh, great. Ridley Scott Napoleon movie, that sounds right up my alley. And then it came out that it was the theatrical cut was going to be two and a half hours. And I was like, excuse me? Like the the, the Venn diagram, sorry, not even the Venn diagram, just sort of the, cat, the, 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 the number of people who want to watch a two and a half hour movie about Napoleon is sort of like exactly the same as the number of people who want to watch a six hour movie about Napoleon. It's like the same group of people. <laughs> 
why would you release something so short? Because the, the thing about Napoleon Bonaparte is that he, even now, still feels like this completely larger than life figure in human history. A friend of mine calls him like the literal world spirit, which is a bit of an exaggeration. My friend is like a big Hegel guy. But I think that kind of captures why Napoleon's been so captivating the people since when he was alive and, and since his death. And so when I when I saw the movie this past Saturday, I had that in my head that this is maybe too short. And also there is word that maybe there's like a four hour Ridley cut that might come out at some point. And my sense of the film watching it was that, A, unless you have some baseline knowledge of the course of the French Revolution, it's incomprehensible. Like at least some of the narrative stuff happening, like who are these people? Why are they important? What exactly is happening? But more than that, it just felt like a movie that had a bunch missing from it. Um, because it seems to me that the, the, the aim of the film is actually to reduce Napoleon to human size. But I'm not sure it that the version we saw necessarily accomplishes that, in part because so much is left to basically inference, right? We, we have to kind of assume... Uh, events, assume transformations. We don't necessarily see them play out on the screen. What we see are key moments. We see, you know, his relationship with Josephine, which is a major part of the film. We see battles, but kind of Napoleon as ordinary dude is actually kind of obscured by how much of the movie has to kind of move through a bit of a Wikipedia page. Oh, I love that you uh, mentioned Wikipedia page, Jamal, because literally the conversation my husband and I had when we came out, I enjoyed it. I was like, I loved it. It was like an animated Wikipedia page. I <laughs> had forgotten just enough about exactly who won which battle and were against whom to have some tension and suspense in the battle scenes. And I share your desire to see the purported four hour cut. I I, I do agree with the in for a penny, in for a pound analysis, in for a sue, in for a franc. Um, like if I'm going to watch this, I'd rather watch the whole thing, but I don't know. I just enjoyed it. And then my husband, who I think may be wiser than me on this matter, um, was like, no, that was the problem with it. It was an animated Wikipedia page. It didn't have anything more to say much about <laughs> this period or this guy other than like, whoa, like th this history is kind of closer than you think and was totally bonkers, uh, which I think is fair. <laughs> Like, I'm not sure the movie achieves a uh, much complicated argument or thought about Napoleon. And I and Joaquin's performance sort of instills some ideas about that. Like he manages to play petulant and commanding at the same time, which I think is one of the human mysteries of Napoleon's story. And you believe it through the charisma of Joaquin Phoenix, or at least I did. But anyway, I enjoyed the <laughs> pageantry, I guess, of it. But I agree that it didn't necessarily have much that was more complicated to say. I mean, I found this movie so disappointing. It's such a strange thing to say that a movie is both what's there on the screen is is not enough and not enjoyable, and yet you want more of it. And I agree with you, <laughs> Jamel, that I, I can't wait for the director's cut, which is not a mystery. I think Ridley Scott has said that when it comes to streaming, it will be the four-hour director's cut, which Ridley Scott loves his director's cuts. It's sort of odd that he wouldn't just put it up there on the screen in the first place, given that we're in the season of very long movies. I think, as you say, people would have sat through it. But... To me, yeah, the problem of this movie is a problem of scale and the balancing of scale. And I say this in my review of it on Slate, is that we're either in this micro intimate space of the marriage of Napoleon and Josephine and almost not even knowing who the, you know, the courtiers are, the people surrounding them. You know, there's really no other developed characters except for those two. Or we're in these vast battlefield spaces with these, you know, geometric phalanxes of soldiers marching around who we also don't know who they are, right? They're sort of players on a giant chessboard. And there's not really any space in between. And to me, it's that space in between, which is the, the historical characters surrounding them, like Robespierre and the Duke of Wellington, like people who obviously have their own stories that would be fascinating to know and, and would be important to know in order to understand how this anomalous event in, in European history occurred, right? That, you know, this commoner suddenly comes out of nowhere and pronounces himself emperor. Uh, 
that was all stuff that you would have had to read several other wiki Wikipedia pages, as I did on researching my review, in order to put together how all these pieces fit together. So I didn't care about historical accuracy per se, and Sir Ridley has been going around sneering at anyone who picks at the historical accuracy of the movie, uh, just saying that it doesn't matter because it's Hollywood, essentially. I agree with that. I think there should be compression and, you know, whatever version of, of embellishment needs to be there to make it a good story. But I would like for that story to to teach you something about the historical context that Napoleon was moving in. And I think the movie really fails at that level. I think, you know, so after I watched this, I decided to actually go watch um, Scott's first feature, The Duelist, which takes place during the same period of time. Um, it takes place uh, during the really Napoleon's emperorship um, and is about it's, it's uh, Keith Carradine and uh, Harvey Keitel play two French officers who are basically sort of like in recurring duels for 20 years. Um, it's sort of like a story, like what if you had the most psychotic hater alive kind of story. <laughs> um, and, <laughs> and that movie is very much about sort of like the hollowness and the brittleness and ultimately sort of the silliness of notions of martial honor. And I kind of feel like Scott was going with something similar with Napoleon, sort of showing that all of this, you know, pomp and circumstance and, you know, nonsense about honor, it all really is just sort of like cover for baser urges, for insecurities, for all these sorts of things. And I think you're right, Julia, that Joaquin Phoenix can sell some of that just through the strength of his performance, which is quite good. But I don't think the rest of the movie is really doing any of that any favors. I, I think the rest of the movie should have bogged down and kind of like, you know, moving from, um, you know, set piece to set piece. I do think too, like, I think fundamentally the movie doesn't really have an animating question or theory about Napoleon, but the movie does spend a ton of time on Napoleon's relationship with Josephine. And there is a commanding performance by Vanessa Kirby as Josephine, who is willful and imperious. And they've got their own vibe and love and kink underneath it all. And I suppose to the degree the movie is interested in that relationship, it posits that like Napoleon was successful Air he saw Josephine, or rather, air he ditched Josephine, and then afterwards it all fell apart. Um, what did you guys make of that relationship? I mean, the, again, the performance, it's like per perfectly pleasant to be in a scene with them. Obviously, that relationship was historically important, but it felt like the movie wanted me to see that as some kind of skeleton key to understanding his historical personage, his personality, his success, his failures, etc. And I didn't feel like it was fully baked enough to hold that position in the film either. How about you guys? Yeah, I think that's the scale problem I was referring to in a way, is, is that the scenes between them are, are good. In fact, I think it's that's probably the high point of the movie is what you describe as the kinky relationship between the two of them, which is this constant power struggle, you know, that each of them wants the other to sort of abase themselves and sort of say, I can't live without you. And there's these scenes where they make each other repeat, <laughs> you know, I'm nothing without you. I love the sadomasochism of that relationship and the idea that it, somebody who was so commanding in public would, would have this kind of um, desire to be humiliated and private. I think the problem again is is that scale problem where you don't see you don't see him sort of telescoping between those two things. We're either watching him debase himself intimately with Josephine or we're watching him command mass groups of troops on the battlefield and you don't see the part of him that had leadership qualities that got him to the point of being able to command those troops because he's all is racing so quickly from point to point, you know, as, as Jamel was saying, sort of establishing these Wikipedia chapters of his life that you don't really see why that contrast is interesting, if that makes sense. I know. I think I think that's right. It's also it, it speaks to the, the extent to which you don't quite get the fullness of the attempt to show the codependency of Napoleon and Josephine speaks to how the movie really needs other needs more time for other characters. I think there's, there's something there with Napoleon's mother, right. That could be expanded that can sort of, sort of, sort of, you know, help develop the theme 
of kind of a kind of codependency between Napoleon Bonaparte and the women in his life. But the movie just doesn't, it's just not there. Maybe it'll be there in the four hour version, but in the movie that we can see at the moment, it's just not there. All right. Well, the movie is Napoleon. It is in theaters now in its non-director's cut version. If you see it and you want to send us your own thoughts, please write us at culturefest at slate.com. This episode is brought to you by Progressive Insurance. Whether you love true crime or comedies, celebrity interviews, news, or motivational speakers, you call the shots on what's in your podcast queue. And guess what? Now you can call the shots on your auto insurance, too. Enter the Name Your Price tool from Progressive. The Name Your Price tool puts you in charge of your auto insurance by working just the way it sounds. You tell Progressive how much you want to pay for car insurance. Then they'll show you a variety of coverages that fit within your budget, giving you options. Now that's something you'll want to press play on. It's easy to start a quote and you'll be able to choose the best option for you fast. It's just one of the many ways you can save with Progressive Insurance. Quote today at Progressive.com to try the Name Your Price tool for yourself and join the over 28 million drivers who trust Progressive. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. Price and coverage match limited by state law. This podcast is brought to you by Slate Studios and SAP. How do you know when to seize the moment for growth? When the opportunity arrives, you need to be ready. That means future-proofing your business with a technology partner like SAP and embracing AI with confidence. My name is Kavita Ganesan. I'm the author of The Business Case for AI, and I advise leaders and tech teams on how to go about their AI initiatives. AI is a special type of software automation which tries to solve complex problems, like it can ingest lots of data and then render one decision. Companies have barely scratched the surface with AI. If you take an industry like supply chain, their data is all over the place. You have data in procurement, you have data in sales, you have data in manufacturing. So you need a single platform to bring all of that data together and help analyze that data. Companies are slowly going to start integrating AI into their workflows. That will change the whole business landscape. So instead of doing all the low-level work, people will be the data creators for AI systems. Having AI in the loop will help businesses become more sustainable over the long term, survive different problems, shutdowns. So I'm excited about the prospects of that. Relevance, reliability, responsibility. Future-proof your business with SAP Business AI. Head to sap.com slash be ready to learn more. All right. Well, now is the moment in our podcast where we talk business. We have two items of business this week. First of all, we're putting out the call for our annual listener call-in episode. If you're a new listener, this is pretty self-explanatory. Every year around the holidays, we dedicate one whole episode to answering listeners' questions. The questions could be about culture or they could be about whatever you like. Sometimes we get hypothetical questions like, would you live in a murder house? I think that's one we've answered or perhaps avoided answering in the past. So get in touch and ask us whatever you want. You can give us a call and leave a message at this number, 260-337-8260. That's 260-FEST-260. Or you can email us at culturefest at slate.com. And maybe we'll pick your question to answer during our call-in show, which will air later this year or the first thing in 2024 at the latest. Our second item of business is just to tell you about today's Slate Plus segment. This week, at Julia's suggestion, we're going to be talking about weights and measures in baking. It's a very specific topic, but because we have Jamel Bowie on the show this week, who is a great cook and loves to write and post about the things he bakes and cooks, and because we all just had Thanksgiving where we were embarking on different baking projects, we're going to talk about when you bake, whether you use classic cup and spoon measurements or a baking scale. Some people who use volume or weight as a measurement, which is not normally the usual American way, have strong opinions about it, and Jamel apparently does. So we're going to talk about that during today's Slate Plus segment. If you're a Slate Plus member, you will hear that at the end of our show. And if you're not a Slate Plus member, here's how you can become one. Sign up at slate.com slash culture plus. In exchange for your membership, you get ad-free podcasts. You get bonus content like the segment I just described, which many other shows have as well. And you get unlimited access to all the writing and all the podcasting on slate.com. You'll be supporting our work and the work of our brilliant colleagues, so please sign up today at slate.com slash culture plus. Once again, that's slate.com slash culture plus. Okay, on with the show. Scott Pilgrim started life in the 1990s as the title of a song by the Canadian indie band Plum Tree. The song tells us essentially nothing about who Scott Pilgrim the character is, 
But the Canadian cartoonist Brian Lee O'Malley imagined him as a Toronto-based slacker who's the bassist in an unsuccessful band called Sex Bubomb, who finds himself caught up in a series of grand video game style battles with the seven evil exes of the young woman he's just started dating, Ramona Flowers. O'Malley published a series of six Scott Pilgrim books between 2004 and 2010. Before the last book had come out, also in 2010, the English director Edgar Wright made an adaptation of all six books, a movie called Scott Pilgrim vs. the World, which was a flop at the box office but has since become a beloved cult object. There's also a Scott Pilgrim video game, fittingly enough, since the playing of video games is a big part of the story. And now there's a new piece of media in the Scott Pilgrim verse. Scott Pilgrim takes off. It's an eight-part Netflix series, and it's not exactly a spinoff. It's certainly not a remake or a sequel. It's interesting to talk about how it relates to the rest of the universe, and maybe we'll get into that. But you might think of it as a sort of alternate version of the story that is told through the comic books and the movie. Nearly the entire cast of the Edgar Wright movie from 2010 has returned to, to revoice their character. So in this clip, you'll hear Michael Sarah as Scott Pilgrim and Satya Baba as Matthew Patel, who, as you'll hear in the clip, is one of the evil exes who's come back to exact revenge. Who are you exactly and why are we fighting? Uh, aren't you Scott Pilgrim? Depends who's asking. It is not. Matthew Patel. Ramona's first evil ex-boyfriend. Cool. And you're here because... Didn't you read my letter? Kind of. Hmm. I had delivered it during a blizzard! Remind me what it said exactly. Ah. It said, Ramona Flowers has seven evil exes, each more powerful than the last, all of whom you must defeat in order to date her. It was a very detailed letter. All right, Julia, I'm going to start with you here. I don't know what your history with Scott Pilgrim is. As I was recounting, there's a lot of different ways to have gotten familiar with this character and series, but maybe you knew nothing about it up to now. I'm curious if that's the case, how the Netflix series stood on its own for you or didn't. Well, I have a fair amount of experience with it. You know, I think we talked about the movie on the podcast when it came out and I've read some of the graphic novels. It's based on actually the song... Scott Pilgrim by the band Plumtree, on which the whole thing is based, was the recessional at my wedding as well. So I don't know if that uh, adds to my bona fides as a critic here. Wow, what a fantastic song for your wedding. I was there, but I don't remember the Plumtree moment. <laughs> it, it has a triumphant spirit. Strongly recommend it as a recessional. Uh, check it out. But anyway, um, my main thought about this series was, why does this exist? The animated style is visually cool. I thought it borrows more from comics. I'm curious to hear Jamel's take on this as well. But it, it feels like it is trying to turn a graphic novel or comics experience into an animated experience in a... Um, manner that's using frames, interestingly, using a, a, a kind of sense of animated cutouts, using, you know, some kapows here and there for the various battle sequences. Um, it also decenters Scott Pilgrim himself, the character, in ways that makes room for other characters to do things that they did not do in the original works, which is interesting, but different than just doing a straight remake, maybe gives you a reason to go back, but it I, I couldn't quite get a beat on why it was doing all that. And I didn't find myself, I don't know, interested, anxious, sad. Uh, like there's a big battle in the first episode and it has a surprising outcome. And I wasn't like, oh, no, there's a scene where Scott and Ramona go on their first date and they're, there's kind of like a cartoon makeout scene. And I was like, I don't know how many cartoons I've seen make out. I don't know if I like it. <laughs> like. <laughs> I, I didn't respond to it despite having a decent amount of fondness for the underlying material. And then it's also really fun to hear all these voices of these actors who were, you know, at a different place in their careers when they assembled to make the live action film a decade ish ago and, and, you know, hearing them back in the, in the years on their voices is kind of fun. Like I, I, I don't have anything against this project, but it didn't land for me at all. Uh, am I alone? Did either of you love it? 
I mean, I, I want to hear Jamel's response first, but I will say having an enormous fondness for the Edgar Wright movie and not really knowing the property other than that. I was just, I felt like it was old home week. Like, I loved that the cast all came back for it. There was something very touching about the fact that they enjoyed working on that project so much that, you know, even though a lot of them are big stars now, Chris Evans, Brie Larson, you know, people who were not superhero level stars when the first movie came out and now are, made time in their schedules to go be these characters into microphones again because they just liked this universe. And there's something that feels like a labor of love about this that I that I really respected. Mm-hmm. I'm also really glad I've, I watched it all the way through. It does doesn't take long because each episode is less than half an hour. And I felt like it really deepened toward the end. If you watch the first episode only, this is a warning for, for Scott Pilgrim heads or, or people who really know the, the, the story well. It's going to feel familiar and you're going to think, why does this exist? It's just a remake. But once that premise is put into place, it goes in a completely different direction, which, as you say, Julia, is much less focused on Scott and more on Ramona, who, I mean, arguably, if there's something that you could say about the 2010 movie that hasn't aged well, it's the gender relations. And I think that the update addresses that in a way that that I I found really kind of touching. Jamal, what about you? I want to know, first of all, what your history with this property is. Uh, you know, I I saw Scott Pilgrim versus the World when it came out in theaters way back when. I've read the graphic novel series. Like, I played the video game. I'm not, I wouldn't call myself, like, a Scott Pilgrim super fan, but I've definitely sort of, like, I, I'm very familiar with the Scott Pilgrim universe, right? And I'm especially familiar with the life of Scott, the, the film in particular, um, in the past, over the past decade or so. And I kind of think that to, to, to make sense of this series, you need to sort of have that kind of like metatextual knowledge about like what have, what's going on with how people understand Scott Program uh, versus the world and sort of those characters. And what it is is that like for a lot of viewers, Scott Pilgrim has been basically like an unambiguous hero. Um, they saw that movie and they're like, oh, Scott Pilgrim is the good guy. Scott Pilgrim is sort of someone to emulate or look up to or identify with, even though I think the movie makes it like mostly clear that no, Scott is sort of immature and self-absorbed and like devoid of self-knowledge and is um, not really ready to be in a serious relationship at all. Uh, and part of the conflict of the film is the extent to which, like, he is just off on this adventure against these seven evil exes, but never really engages in any self-reflection on himself. Um, but there's been this, like, discourse about the movie uh, in the years since it's been out around sort of, like, what it, is Scott a good guy? And I think what makes this show worthwhile is at first it makes clear from the jump that the reading of Scott as like a good guy is like kind of shallow. Like he's immature and self-absorbed and too devoid of self-knowledge um, and can't really sustain any kind of relationship. Um, but the thing I found compelling about the show after that, after kind of making this point about Scott, is that it kind of has that take for everyone. It's sort of it's saying all these characters are like young and dumb. And their conflicts are the product of not really, like, dealing with their emotions and dealing with their feelings. And the show is about, like, everyone kind of growing up a bit. And that, to me, is what makes it interesting. Sort of like it's, it's, it's the show feels like it's responding to a generation of viewers, basically, who have been, like, taking in Scott Pilgrim for, you know, close to 20 years now between the, the, the graphic novel series and the movie um, and saying, you know... These people need to grow up. Um, And here's a project about them growing up in their own ways. Yeah, Brian Lee O'Malley has said himself that, you know, if he had kept on drawing Scott Pilgrim after 2010, when the when the series stopped, he felt like he would have been, you know, just sort of um, milking his his youthful folly that he had essentially outgrown the character that he still had great affection for him, but had had moved on. And that the reason he was willing to return to the character now is that he wanted to to look at him through the, the eyes of a middle-aged man, somebody who'd had more life experience and, and was no longer a contemporary of the mixed-up 20-somethings that he's writing about. And this is what I mean about finishing the series being worthwhile, because I think that that perspective starts to become more, more clear toward the last 
half of of this series. But yeah, I think you nailed it, Jamel, in sort of saying that this is certainly an exploration of the idea, which I think would be wrong even for the original 2010 movie, that Scott Pilgrim is a, is an unabashed good guy. And in fact, in it's a, it's a canonical fact in the Scott Pilgrim universe that at the beginning of the series, at the beginning of all of these adaptations as well, he's dating a high schooler. He's a guy in his early 20s. I think he's supposed to be 22 or 23. 23, and, I think. 23. And he has a 17-year-old girlfriend, sort of girlfriend, a, a girl that he is hanging out with, uh, apparently chastely, named Knives Chow, uh, voiced by Ellen Wong in the movie and now again in the show. She is also a much more developed character who gets an arc in this story. Uh, there could be a criticism made that his, you know, his dating of a high schooler is a little bit too easily um, dismissed as, you know, just a, a character flaw that he gets over as opposed to something he has done to her. But but Knives Chow really gets a chance in this show to be more than the rejected high school girlfriend. What did you guys think of the animation style? I mean, I I, I watched far enough in to see that it was going somewhere new and I didn't get to the end. So maybe I didn't give it enough of a shot. But I, I don't know. My experience of this world up to now has been that it's surprising and compelling and fresh and pulls me in. And there was something about, I don't know, the, the, despite the visual beauty of the animation style, like I didn't, it didn't lure me in. It did not, I, I, it, it felt like a a bit of a wall between me and the universe. I mean, I'm thinking back to what you said about Napoleon and like relying on inference and memory to, to carry you through. Like I felt like, this show assumed a level of interest and affection and curiosity about what these guys were going to be up to next that I do not possess despite a base level of fondness for them. And it didn't kind of independently earn my interest in them. I I thought it looked really, really cool. I mean, I'm not sure. I can't go back and watch it from the point of view of somebody who didn't know the movie and feel a certain amount of, of affection, at least for the cast, for the voice cast. But I'm not I'm not a huge reader of comics. I'm not a huge watcher of anime. And I think a lot of what I admired in it was something that that a lot of anime projects would contain. But I just appreciated the visual snap and the attention to to things like, you know, color and movement and editing like it just it ha- it snaps along. It's it's easy. As I said, it, it goes down good and it goes down easy. Then again, I'm not sure how much of what I sensed as the emotional depth of it would feel very deep if you didn't know about previous iterations of the story. What about you, Jamel? Were you, were you caught up in the, the look and the sound of it? I thought it looked great. I mean, I, I, I am, I'm a sucker for anything well animated and this was like, it was really well animated. I actually think that one of the underrated things Netflix is doing right now is putting out lots of like really high quality animation uh, and not, not simply compute like, you know, CG animation, but like, you know, 2D, uh, two-dimensional animation, more traditional styles of animation. So I thought it was, I don't know, the the visual, like, I, I'm, I'm sort of like, you know, a guy who's consumed lots of Scott Pilgrim, I'm kind of the audience for this, and I really liked it, and I appreciated sort of like what it, like how, how it was responding to sort of viewers and, and fans and discourse and everything, but not doing so in a kind of like, you know, didactic way, but kind of just like, hey, we're commenting on this as much as we're giving you a, a new story. I mean, I can tell you from having hung out on some Scott Pilgrim subreddits over the weekend that it's not fan service in the sense that, you know, every fan is being gratified by the existence of this series. There's arguments about it. And, you know, those who like the direction it takes the character in and those who don't. So I, I, I agree that it's there's something more going on besides, you know, let's take some IP and serve it back up to people, you know, warmed over. It's it's It feels, as I said earlier, like to me, like a labor of love. And that alone kind of sets it apart and makes it feel worth watching. All right. Well, the series is called Scott Pilgrim Takes Off. It's on Netflix streaming right now. Um, take a look at it and see what you think. This episode is brought to you by Quince, the go-to place for luxury essentials at affordable prices for everyone on your list, including yourself. Quince offers a range of high-quality items with prices within reach, like 100% Mongolian cashmere sweaters from $50, washable silk tops and dresses, cotton sweaters, and comfy pants. I happen to be wearing a Quince silk shirt right now that they kindly gave me as a sample product. I didn't even know we were reading this ad today on the show. I just love my red silk shirt. It's really nice, soft silk. It's the thick kind of silk that doesn't sort of show bumps and lumps underneath. It feels a little bit armored, so it's nice for a chilly day. Uh, They have a lot of silk choices on the Quince website, and I went with this shirt because I was 
kind of running low on nice tops, but the skirts are really, really appealing. And that may be the next thing I dig into, an all silk, thick, shiny skirt from Quince. The nice thing about scrolling their website is that even though this stuff is made of nice fabric, it is pretty affordable and everything is priced 50 to 80% less than similar online brands. Get affordable luxury for everyone on your list with Quince. Go to quince.com slash culture for free shipping on your order and 365 day returns. That's Q-U-I-N-C-E dot com slash culture to get free shipping and 365 day returns. Quince.com slash culture. Apple Card is the credit card created by Apple. You earn 3% daily cash back up front when you use it to buy a new iPhone 15, AirPods, or any products at Apple. And you can automatically grow your daily cash at 4.15% annual percentage yield when you open a high-yield savings account. Apply for Apple Card in the Wallet app on iPhone. Apple Card subject to credit approval. Savings is available to Apple Card owners subject to eligibility. Savings accounts by Goldman Sachs Bank USA, member FDIC. Terms apply. As one half of the Atlanta rap duo Outkast, Andre 3000 was behind some of the biggest hits of the early 2000s. But Outkast's last album was released 17 years ago, and in the time since then, Andre Benjamin has been pretty musically quiet until a couple weeks ago when he surprised everyone by coming out with an all-instrumental album of ambient flute-based soundscapes titled New Blue Sun. There's a lot to say about this album. Let's start off by hearing a clip from it. And in order to get a sense of how unusual and idiosyncratic this album is, you also need to hear the full title of the song we're about to hear a clip from. It's the opening cut on New Blue Sun. And the title of the song is I Swear I Really Wanted to Make a Rap Album, But This Is Literally the Way the Wind Blew Me This Time. It's worth noting, too, that that song, I believe, is 10 minutes and something seconds long. Other cuts on the album are about 12 minutes long. So it really is soundscapes that we're moving through uh, rather than individual cuts. Um, And in fact, that song is unusually melodic and hooky for the songs on this album, I would say. Uh, Jamel, (laughs) I'm going to start with you again, because I think among us, you are probably the most outcast completist on the panel. Um, So I want to hear a little bit uh, of of your background with outcast and then what you thought of New Blue Sun. Sure. Um, I feel like I'm right in the middle of kind of like the demographic for people who were in Outcast. Like I'm a 30 something black Southerner <laughs> who was uh, previously a teenage black Southerner, um, a teenager when Outcast's biggest hits were kind of, you know, in the circulation from Bombs Over Baghdad to Hey Ya when I was a little bit younger than that, right? There was Rosa Parks. Outkast has been producing hits since the mid-90s. They're kind of one of the most important groups in hip-hop history um, for kind of establishing the South as like an important center of of hip-hop production. Um, Andre 3000 famously said, I think it was the 95 Source Awards, the South has something to say, and it's a very kind of big moment in the history of hip-hop. And I've listened, you know, I've listened to every single outcast record many many times um so okay i enjoyed this record i listened to it while making thanksgiving dinner and interestingly enough you know for as much as it is literally quite different than anything andre 3000 has ever done it also does feel very much of a piece with outcast and what i mean is that I think many people associate Outkast with these big, catchy, poppy songs like Hey Ya or like um, The Way You Move. But if you listen to those whole records, um, they are filled with stuff that is kind of 
abstract and unusual for hip hop records. So on um, on their record, I'm probably going to mispronounce this, and people are going to get mad about it. Um, Aquameni, Aquameni, uh, I'm never quite sure how to say it. Which is the record that Rosa Parks is on? There are two songs. One's called Chunky Fire. The other's Liberation, which are these sort of longer, partly instrumental um, liberation, sort of a, almost spoken wordy at times, sort of like hip hop, like meandering. By the same locus, cause it's a hard road to hoe. If your ass don't move and the rain don't fall and the ground is dry, but the roots are strong, so some survive. To your surprise, now I watch their cries. And so it's interesting to me how much how how different this record is, but how much to me it's like recognizably a member of Outcast. Once you when you when you think of Outcast as not simply being um, the hooks, but kind of in a lot of ways like you know, in, in, on many of the records like these soundscapey sort of digressions. And so this to me again feels like congruent with what what came before. Very different in in obvious ways, but also like. This is, you know, the same guy doing this stuff. Yeah, Julia, maybe what's what's most out of left field about this album is not the fact that Andre 3000 would be interested in doing these kind of explorations. That kind of seems like of a piece with his musical curiosity of longstanding. But the fact that he would kind of have the, the chutzpah to come out with this album, an entire album of music that contains not a single spoken word and, you know, is, is pretty demanding on the listener. How did this strike you? Oh, I don't think it struck me as demanding. Like I, I, I listened to it a bunch of times, uh, cooking, driving around, uh, driving around with my mother, who's listened to a lot less Outcast than I have, and who um, was like, "What's this? Can, can, can you give albums for Christmas anymore? I want to give it to my friend Kurt, who loves flute." <laughs> you know, like it, it kind of goes down easy as a listening experience. Um, and I agree that although it's been treated in the press as like, "Holy moly, what a surprising thing." to do I feel like the congruency with Outcast's musicality I heard too Jamel like the 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 sense that this is a continuous part of a musical exploration by someone who is brilliant and curious and confident I mean the chutzpah didn't surprise me either the the musical choice didn't surprise me in a way and the chutzpah didn't surprise me because because the originality of the sound of Outcast is part of what has made it so compelling to so many people for so long. So anyway, I enjoyed it. I liked it. And then I started thinking about how do you talk about ambient sound and like, what is my vocabulary for ambient music? And is this different from spa music? Like in a way, it sounds like the music they would play at the spa if you were like getting a, you know, facial or something. And I don't have any vocabulary to think about the quality of that music. <laughs> like, I don't really know how to think about the quality of ambient music in that way. And I I don't say that as a diss to either this album or the world's finest spa music, but just it w- it went down so easy. I was uncertain how to think about it because I think in my own Um, appreciation of music because I'm such a word person. I'm so focused often on lyrics and how they intersect with the sonics. And anyway, I just felt a little bit unmoored from my critical faculties once I listened to it more and more. Um, So I float that uh, ambient glimmering or blight question back over your way, Dana. Also, I, I will say if Steve were here, I think he would make the joke that this is like the kind of music we've been teasing Dana for liking the whole, you know, decade plus of our podcast of kind of like quiet tweedling. So uh, (laughs) Dana, what did you think of the quiet tweedling? Yeah, funnily enough, it is and it isn't. You know, I thought of that too. I also had it on. I mean, we probably all did some cooking to it because over the last week in prepping, we were all doing our Thanksgiving prep. But it is the kind of music I listen to and that I will often listen to, especially while working, instrumental, wordless music. But th- that music is usually either classical or um, or like non-Western classical, like ragas or something like that. I just I wouldn't often put on sort of contemporary ambient, you know, Brian Eno-ish kind of music. And so that made it intriguing. And I will say I did find it a challenging listen, which doesn't mean I didn't get enjoyment out of it. But I couldn't imagine it being played in a spa because at least some tracks are just they're not comfortable. And that's what's interesting about them to me is that there's some 
apprehension and almost creepiness in some of the music. Uh, I'm thinking about this track, which is maybe my favorite one, but also, you know, one that demands, it, it creates a mood that isn't entirely spa-like and comforting, which is that night in Hawaii when I turned into a panther and started making these low register purring tones that I couldn't control. Shit was wild. That's the full title. <laughs> The background to this piece is that it's, it was an ayahuasca trip that he took in Hawaii. That was why Andre 3000 turned into a panther. And, uh, and he's talked about this in interviews that, you know, he had this kind of otherworldly experience of self-transformation and felt like he was an instrument being played by the world, which is a really great metaphor, almost like he was the flute. And, uh, and inspired by that, created this piece of music. And without knowing that was even the title, at some point I had this on while I was in the bathtub. So I was just sort of like spacing out to the ambient sound, not looking at the titles. Then later I realized that the piece that I had found jungle-like, you know, you were saying it's hard to, it's hard to find words to describe this. I was sort of imagining that it was some sort of jungle and it maybe sounded a little Amazonian, right? Because there's some flute music used in that part of the world. And it turned out that that was the ayahuasca trip song, you know, that kind of created this musical jungle around itself. So uh, I don't know if that's really a response to your question, Julia. But yeah, although although it creates soundscapes you move through, I, I don't feel like they're relaxing, new agey, soothing soundscapes. I would agree with that. I, I don't think I would listen to this... Um while trying to relax necessarily. <laughs> uh, it's very much, and then doing it while cooking, it's sort of like, it's, it's something to have on um, and to hear. But I'm trying to think of the context under which I would really be sitting down and listening to it. It might just be sort of sitting in my living room with a nice pair of headphones on, like and listening to it. And that's what I think I, I, I should do at some point, which is um, uh, find like the highest fidelity version of this I can and listen to it on like a nice pair of headphones. Um, Cause I do, I do think that this is the kind of music it is. It is like, it is specifically you sit down and you listen to it music. Yeah. It's not exactly socializing music. I'm interested that Julia, your mom was, was intrigued and wanted to get a copy of it. That's great. But I can imagine sort of shutting down a conversation by putting this album on because it draws attention to itself, I think. And it's kind of meandering uh, weirdness. Yeah, you put it on at the end of a party. Right. It's the chaser. <laughs> you get people to leave your living either, room. Either help with the dishes or get out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I will say, I, I listened to the long interview that Under 3000 gave with NPR about this um, project. And he's just such an interesting talent. And the way he describes, like, collecting flutes over recent years since he picked up an interest in them and learning about the cultural history of different types of global flutes and his relationship with his flute master and the fact that I guess when he just gets in the back of cabs, he plays flute immediately <laughs> all the time instead of messing. He talks about using the flute instead of, you know, messing around on his phone, which I love. And, you know, there's been video documentation of him playing the flute in the wild, like just the knowledge, curiosity, depth of experience musicality behind this is um i listened to that after i had listened to the album a few times but it makes you feel warmly about the experimentation and exploration that's going on here for sure all right well the album is new blue sun it's definitely worth giving a listen if you're interested in what andre 3000 is up to or just if you want to hear some some really cool and sometimes creepy sounds you want control of your financial future and schwab knows that that's why when it comes to managing your wealth, Schwab gives you more choices, like full-service wealth management and advice when you need it most. You can also invest on your own and trade on Think or Swim, their powerful, award-winning trading platforms. Plus, you'll get low costs, transparent pricing, and 24-7 live help. Because Schwab understands it's your financial journey, and they believe you should have choices in how you invest. Visit schwab.com to learn more. All right. It looks like we've gotten to the part of our show where we endorse. And I don't have to go first this time because I'm hosting. So uh, who, who wants to endorse first? Do either of you have a preference? I'll go first. Okay. 
I recently picked up the new 4K release of Andrew Davis's 1993 film, The Fugitive, um, a movie I love. Uh, boy, boy, can I tell you, a movie I love. <laughs> has there been an unclear uh, and present danger on The Fugitive, or is it not the there, right kind of movie? There has. Yeah, we did it just because I love it too much to not talk about it uh, on, on my podcast. It's I feel like I don't have to describe it, but basically, if you've never seen The Fugitive, it is based off of the 1960s television show, and Harrison Ford plays a doctor, Richard Kimball, who is accused and convicted of killing his wife, but he insists he does not do it. He escapes, and he's hunted down by a U.S. Marshal played by Tommy Lee Jones. It was a blockbuster hit when it came out back in 93, third highest domestic gross of the year, earned, I think, seven Academy Award nominations. Like, it was a big sensation. Um, and it's just, like, a wonderful movie to watch. It had been – you've been able to buy a Blu-ray for the longest time, but it, it was never a particularly good transfer. And this new 4K uh, restoration looks amazing. Um, it's, a, it's a full kind of you – know, I think they used the original negative. Like, it, it looks great. And um, I watched it over the weekend. Uh, it's just like it's a beautiful Chicago movie. And I, I think it's sort of underrated as like a great Chicago movie full of Chicago character actors um, shot on location throughout Chicago. Andrew Davis is a director from Chicago and has m many of his movies has have like had these lo Chicago location shots. Harrison Ford, I believe it's from Chicago as well. Um, and so it's like if you if you if you love the city of Chicago, if you love a good thriller, Highly, and if you have a 4K Blu-ray player, highly recommend you pick up this new um, edition of The Fugitive. It's such a fun movie. I cannot uh, say enough uh, how much I like it. I've seen it like uh, two dozen times. And it, does not, it, it does not get old. <laughs> it's such a Jamel oh, movie. I feel like I could, that, that, that movie was created in a lab for your exact sensibility. But it's true that it's one of those movies that you wish that there were more that there was just like a whole shelf of movies that made you feel like The Fugitive, you know, that kind of very solid. I mean, I guess in a way that's what your podcast is all about, those very solid kind of dad thrillers, you know? Right, right. Yeah, it's yeah, the dad, ultimate exactly. dad thriller. Dad, but this, I'll say, you know, I don't want to uh, hog the time here, but I'll say like, in addition to just being extremely well made, which I think is so much part of its part of its charm, it's just sort of like it's, it's a very, very well made movie with every choice made seems to be the exact right one for the story they, they, they're trying to tell. Um, it's it's a much smarter movie than you think. It's a movie that seems aware on some level of the fact that, for example, the only reason Harrison Ford's character can escape for so long is that he's a white man. And the movie sort of is not shy about like emphasizing that like this is only possible because of his like race and class status, really. Um, and it's it's, I don't know, it's a smarter movie than you think. Uh, it's it's uh, again really well made and like a joy to to look at and watch, and um, you know I, if you're the kind of person who's like me who's always complaining about like how modern blockbusters are made, it's fun to watch something where it's like oh yeah there's a big train derailment in the movie and a bus crashes and they actually like kind of they derail the train and crash the bus like they <laughs> to do the thing they they did the thing it wasn't like done with computers and it's like it's fun to um you know see a movie use practical effects like that oh you're really making me want to rewatch the fugitive i can't wait i feel like that was maybe the first like grown-up thriller i saw in theaters you know i think i was like just the right age in my early teens or whatever to go see kind of like a grown-up movie and um and just love it. And I don't know that I've watched it again since, and I definitely should. Um, my endorsement is another deep cut from the Summer Strut recommendations that I was reminded of this week because of our segment on New Blue Sun. But one of our wonderful listeners submitted a Dylan song that was new to me. Um, it is the song Not Dark Yet off of his 1997 album, Time Out of Mind. And it is not strutty. It's very, it's very kind of loping and uh, slow and reflective. A love that I know that I never can share God, it's not dark yet, but it It's 
just beautiful. And I have a real soft spot for like late Dylan. Like I just think modern Dylan, here's another brilliant artist who uh, I'm curious what he's going to do next. I even like some of the songs on his Christmas album, you know, like I, I will, I will, and I'm not even the world's or even the Slate podcast versus foremost Dylanologist by a long shot, but just um, the trueness of his artistic instinct. I think I mentioned this when I talked about the last waltz a couple weeks ago, but like there's all these like seventies macho buffoons swanning around, like, you know, rubbing their egos against each other for the whole stupid movie. And then at the end, Bob Dylan shows up and he's just like in this beam of icy blue light from the sky. He seems so impervious to all of their ego and idiocy because it feels like his art is coming from somewhere else. Anyway, I have the same feeling about Andre 3000. And so it's a bit of a leap, but for the unexpected uh, later work files, check out Not Dark Yet by Bob Dylan, if you don't know it already. Oh, yeah. I love, know and love that song and that whole album it comes from, Time Out of Mind, which I think of, I'm also probably not Dylanologist enough to to place this as a landmark, but I think of Time Out of Mind as kind of the, the, the dawn of the late Dylan period, you know, when he came he came back roaring with a bunch of great songs and albums, and I think of that yeah. as one of the landmarks of that period. How about you, Dana? All right. My endorsement is inspired by the Andre 3000 flute album, New Blue Sun. Uh, as I was listening to it, I was thinking of a favorite album of mine that is also by a flautist uh, who is an avant-garde nutcase who just does what he wants to do musically and always takes you somewhere interesting. And that is Eric Dolphy, who is a was a multi-instrumental jazz player. He played all kinds of anything you could blow into. Basically, he played clarinet and bass clarinet, and I think he played some sax. He's most known as a flutist, but he is just one of those really scronky, out-there jazz avant-garde guys from the early 60s. And his last album, it was made the year he died, um, just a few months before he died. I think it came out in 1964. It's called Out to Lunch. And it's just one of the great jazz albums of all time, but a little bit like the Andre 3000 album we were talking about. It's not the kind of warm, cozy, you know, enveloping jazz where you imagine yourself, I don't know, like um, in a in a cozy nightclub with your sweetheart. It is a little more disturbing and exploratory and experimental. Um, and it's not just his playing that's that goes to all kinds of crazy places, but those of the the ensemble and the session with them, which includes Freddie Hubbard on the trumpet and Bobby Hutcherson on keyboards. It's just a classic album that I sort of have in my jazz rotation for when you want a more challenging something on in the background, Out to Lunch by Eric Dolphy. Uh, can I say that I, I love that record? It's a great one, right? I mean, it's, it's yeah. just one of the great jazz albums. All right. Well, Jamel and Julia, thank you so much for coming on this week. We've got our Slate Plus segment still to go, but that does it for our main show. You can find links to some of the things we talked about today on our show page, which is at slate.com slash culturefest. You can also always email us at culturefest at slate.com. Our intro music is by the composer Nicholas Brittell. Our production assistant is Kat Hong. Our producer is Cameron Drews. I'm Dana Stevens. Thanks so much for listening, and we'll see you soon. USAA insurance to help you save. Take advantage of discounts when you cover your home and your ride. Discover how we're helping members save at USAA.com slash bundle. USAA. Restrictions apply. Hey everybody, it's Tim Heidecker. You know me, Tim and Eric, Bridesmaids and uh, Fantastic Four. I'd like to personally invite you to listen to Office Hours Live with me and my co-hosts 
DJ Doug Pound. Hello. And Vic Berger. Howdy. Every week we bring you laughs, fun, games, and lots of other surprises. It's live. We take your Zoom calls. Music. We love having fun. Excuse me? Songs. Vic said something. Music. Songs. Music. I like having fun. I like to laugh. I like to meet people who can make me laugh. Please subscribe. No.